Hello everybody and welcome back to Military Aviation History. I'm your host Bismarck and today I am joined by Bernhard from Military History Visualized. Once again, definite proof that we are not the same person. Now, recently I got a comment uh, essentially saying on the MiG-21 that this aircraft, this jet, is still fast by modern standards. And I'm not quite sure if it was implied, but maybe it was saying, you know, it's, it still is competitive in that regard. And it still has, you know, the speed to keep up with all these modern machines and because they haven't really gone beyond the sort of speed levels that the MiG-21 has set out. And I think this is quite an interesting discussion, actually, because we can talk about sort of the saturation points in technology and how useful certain aspects of equipment, military equipment is, in terms of a jet, maybe speed, in terms of tanks, maybe armor, firepower, something like this, when it comes to um, you know, the development of a weapons platform. So I would say, I'll go quickly go into the MiG-21, I'll hand it over to you then as well. So with the MiG-21, yes, it is absolutely a very incredibly fast machine. And if you look at, actually, if you track the speed increase in aircraft from let's say the Second World War, over into the 1960s and 70s, you see a big increase. Yeah, it, I mean, we're going from essentially um, subsonic to uh, uh, supersonic. supersonic. I nearly lost the word there. Not hypersonic. <laughs> Not yet. I was about to go <laughs> hypersonic. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the speed Wasn't increase the is essentially, you know, we're talking 600 kilometers an hour, then 900 kilometers an hour, then just below Mach 1, then we go above that. And then we very quickly go you know, to the MiG-21, 2,100 kph or something like that. Uh, we're reaching a point where speed is, well, it's, it reaches a saturation point because after that we start seeing a sort of a drop off. The F-35, which is essentially the next generation, is actually one of the slower jets out there. But then the question is, does it actually need the speed? Is maybe endurance not more important? is considering that we now have BVRs or beyond visual range engagements where you fire your missiles before you actually see visually uh, see an enemy aircraft you know you just have it on a radar scope do you really need to have that speed is, are certain other aspects maybe not more important and is speed actually not perhaps getting in the way because the MiG-21 also one of the problems there is that it has limited loiter time it really is just you know, you start, you go quickly to a high altitude, you engage the enemy bombers or, yeah, I mean, that was one of the issues why the MiG-21 was built. At high altitude engagements and interceptions, you land, rinse and repeat. Essentially, I don't want to say it's a point defense system because it does have a certain amount of range, but it is not exactly something like, uh, let's say, a Panavia Tornado, which was meant for a completely different role, but then, for example, by the British adopted for also a fighter role because it had that loiter time where it could patrol around the coastline of the US and intercept bears, um, you know, Russian, Soviet and then Russian bears. Yeah, there we go. So if we hand it over maybe to ground combat, you uh, might have something to say there as well when it comes to tanks. I was still with, with the aircraft, I was thinking sure. like stealth is also an issue. Yes. So, so with, with tanks, you usually have the, the trinity, basically of armor protection, mobility and firepower. Right. Whereas for, for aircraft, you probably have stealth there as well, for instance, because for, for, you could for, add it, yeah. for tanks, you can use basically, if you look at, at the design in Cold War design, the Leopard 1, it was actually rather weakly armored in mm. comparison, especially to the Panther and the Tiger in the, in the Second World War. Because at, at that point, they assumed, okay, um, we can't really prevent that we get hit unless we move around. So there was a lot more focus on mobility. And I think with planes, you can probably go the same way. You can say, okay, I go with speed or I go with stealth, I guess. And speed at one point was very important. Uh, just prior to World War II, one of the things was get as much speed as possible out of aircraft. Ah, yeah, the Schnell yeah. bomber concept, yeah. right. There we go. Um, also with fighters, you know, getting them up as fast as possible. Climb rates were incredibly important, still are important, arguably. Um, and then certain aspects were sort of pushed to the way, uh, to the side. Whereas nowadays, I mean, you mentioned the Trang Trinity there. I don't think a tr Trinity can be applied as much to an aircraft. You could, could maybe go speed, maneuverability, and firepower, maneuverability instead of armor. Uh, you said wouldn't wouldn't you add stealth? I mean, that I mean, was, that, that, that was, detectability. It's more like because that's what I was going to add. Because now you do have stealth, so you can apply that sort of. It's not longer a Trinity at that point. So 
the, the basic thing is it's any sort of hard stats in a major weapons system is not a linear development. Yeah. It's not always going to get better, you know, faster. Uh, protection, you talked about armor. If we were to track a linear development from the most heavily armed tank in World War II, can we count the mouse as something? That's just a yeah, well, king it tiger. Yeah. Not, yeah. Anyway, we would now be talking about machines that have 300 millimeters of armor. Ain't gonna happen. So it always depends how, how things develop, how technology develops, what new weapon systems come out, what new platforms come out, what new equipment comes out. So just because a jet from the Cold War period is still competitive in certain regards with speed and so on, doesn't mean that it will hold up in a modern engagement, or maybe it will. I mean, I, I mean, I would look here at completely at the at the at the point on how you want to employ and use yes. the weapon system. Exactly. Because from what I understand, and very little, so correct me if I'm wrong. But what you mentioned, the MiG twenty one was basically building an in interceptor. Pretty much. An interceptor you need in a Cold War scenario where you have an asymmetric warfare, so large conventional forces facing each other, or, or conventional in in the sense that they're not asymmetric, but not they are nuclear capable or something. But what, what, what nowadays happens is basically all asymmetric warfare, if you look at it. Yeah. There's not the Soviet, uh, the United States is not fighting the Soviet Union or even Russia or China. The United States is for most of the parts fighting, well, third rate armies. Yeah. And there, loiter time is more important. Speed, well, it doesn't make too much a difference. Stealth is even better because if they can't hit you at all, so I, I would look more at this aspect. So yeah, yeah this, the speed is nice, but all everything, loiter time, range, how much, you, how much, how much yeah. weapons you can yeah. carry, your payload capacity, yeah. what different kinds of payloads you can have, um, how probably you weapon them. parts, yeah. ECM, or what you can put all up there on the technology adaptability. Because I think, I assume in the, in the Cold War, since there was way more, you had dedicated pla weapon, weapons platform. And the F-35, I think, is a multi-role fighter by, it, by that yes. aspect. It depends really what is the weapon platforms, how things develop. Just the, you know, the new helmet that the F-35 pilots use, that already is, you know, some people have said, um, you know, a, a game changer in itself. Because it allows the pilot to do things that no other pilot was able to do before. Like, like, look down and see what's ah, going up. So, so basically, the virtual reality. You could say that, yeah. Okay, that that's neat. It's 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 pretty awesome. It's also, for example, when the uh, MiG twenty nines were training again, the German MiG twenty nines after reunifications were training against NATO aircraft. Uh, the Na NATO realized that it has to actually change their pilot tactics to actually extend the engagement ranges because the MiG twenty one was obviously going to be superior in a close range engagement. And because the helmet of the MiG-21 uh, pil uh, MiG pilots uh, was able to, in certain angles, quickly acquire a target and then immediately get a lock and fire just by the pilot essentially looking at it. Um, and which NATO was at that point not able to do. And they, they now had this you know, look at this technology like, wow, this is pretty cool. And then integrated it. I'm pretty sure they were working on something like this as well, but it's certainly accelerated sort of the... the uh, development of that on in, in, in NATO um, countries. So yeah. Um, so a single stat is, it's always the context is important, yes. I would say, yeah. yeah. And again, I mean, India is still using MiG-29, uh, MiG-21s. <laughs> May have mixed them up there again, so many MiGs, MiG-21s. And they have a lot of them. And for point defense, especially in the environment that they are, yeah. I mean, um, also in some cases, if you don't have anything else. It's you, better to have something. Yeah, yeah. and I uh, assume, I'm, I might be terribly wrong, but I think MiG-21 is probably like similar to the T-55. So basically that it's the, it's a modern, it's already a jet versus the T-55 was basically a main battle tank, which can be operated with a reasonably low amount of maintenance and everything else. Yeah. Because, I mean, is there some other jet that is because, because the thing is like, with, if you look at a T-55, yeah, a, a regular army laughs about a T-55. Yeah. But if you're fighting in a civil war or something where there's no regular armies, a T-55 is a game changer. Yeah. And I'm, I'm not sure with, 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 because with plane, it's way more, um, there's a lot way of, more infrastructure and everything there's else. There's a lot but, of maintenance hours. But the thing is, with the MiG-21, the Soviet Union essentially 
gave that plane after a certain amount of time where they really just kept it in the Soviet Union. Finland was lucky, I think Yugoslavia got some. And then it sort of proliferated on the one, the Warsaw Pact countries. And obviously they gave it also to, you know, third countries around the globe to trying to get some concessions to get them on their side. It's the whole glo uh, Cold War dynamic that's happening there. But for a jet, it is intensive, especially for a country that hadn't used jets before. But compared to some platforms that NATO fielded at the time, I mean, the MiG-21 was relatively simple there. So and the, so one second, with the F-5 Tiger II, you know, that plane was essentially provide, uh, you could say, was developed as an export attempt by the United States to give it to third countries to provide a cheaper, easy to maintain jet, which countries that didn't have the same infrastructure as the United States could then operate. And with the F-5 Tiger um, two, two, the in Vietnam, what crystallized there is that the, the uh, F-5s that the US actually flew, their maintenance hours, especially compared to the F-4 Phantom II, just a small fraction of it. I mean, per, per flight hour. So this is important, of course, and the MiG-21, it proliferated so much that I, I think you can make an argument that for a country that didn't maybe have that infrastructure that a superpower would have, was an incredibly good machine. So probably the, if you look at the lower end of maintenance personnel, yeah. it can handle a T-55 and when it comes to aircraft, which I think the, the level is a bit higher compared to the tank mechanic probably, you still could use a MiG-21 as well. Probably. So yeah, yeah. you have your, your basically your Kalashnikov of the sky. Pretty much. I mean, that's how they were given out. <laughs> so okay. there we go. All right. Anyway, thanks for the question. It was an interesting discussion. It kickstarted us into going into many, many things. Um, keep them coming, as always. Thank you very much for your support on Patreon. Subscribe stuff for you. Channel memberships as well. You guys keeping the lights going. If you enjoyed the show, please consider supporting our channels. And as always, have a great day. Good hunting. Thank you for being here, Bernhard. Thank you for having me. And seeing you in the sky. Thank you for watching and see you next time. Bye.